everybody, Nick Foxcroft, Silver Salmon. We're out here today on the Silver Salmon Custom Express. And if, uh, if you're new to the channel, I've been operating this boat for about 15, 16 years now. And just recently we converted it into an Express. Um, you know, we wanted to kind of go over a few things today. You know, typically we're on the Energy Power Sports boat, our 205 Alumacraft Trophy, which is, uh, really been great for us but you know it's nice to get on here and touch on a few things that some of the big boat has to offer and you know pros and cons between the two of them and um, you know we're, we're pretty excited about this platform now we've kind of pinpointed the key features of operating charters out in lake ontario and um, we've literally built the the boat around the needs and uh and a lot of opportunities a bigger boat opens for clients and you know we fish tournaments for this boat many years you know we were, we were always the slower boat and um, we didn't have much opportunity to run as far as we did but what we lost in that we gained with um, room just just ample room to to run a big program and uh, you know we usually fish three or four guys out in this boat and uh, and we did well you know i, I go back to uh, the mid 2000s there, uh, I think it was 2013, we um, we won King of the Lake, which was a great achievement for uh, for our team there, Moby Nick. And, you know, we, we've, we've done well in this boat as well. And um, when we moved into the Energy Power Sports boat, uh, it was a bit of a learning curve of working with smaller quarters, but also the freedom to run, um, which, which I enjoy the freedom to run, to be honest, and, and the gas mileage. And then you guys have seen through our videos, we've had some, some great events and some tough ones and some bad counting events, but you know, we uh, probably never gonna live that one down. But yeah, let's, let's kind of go over a few things that the old rod wrestler has to offer that, um, you know, some of the guys that are used to fishing smaller boats might not be accustomed to. And some of the big guy, guys that run the bigger boats, some of the things that uh, they might pick up on from a little bit of a tutorial on this boat. I've been fishing on the rod wrestler, geez, most of my uh, chartering career. And um, when I use the term Custom Express, it was a flybridge boat for many years. It's a 1977 post. Uh, it came up into the Great Lakes into the early 80s. And I've been the third charter captain to take it over. So it's a, it's a very fishy boat. Uh, but as, as times have changed, you know, boat manufacturing has adapted. And to be honest, uh, the Express seems to be a lot more commonly used boat. And for this application, it's ideal. You know, in the charter charter industry, everyone wants to be part of the action. You know, we used to have a big enclosure here with a great sitting area, some nice leather couches, you know, guys could take a nap on. Um, but to be honest, the majority of our guys wanted to be out in the back deck. So we just pretty much extended the back deck. Um, we did go looking to find um, an Express of this size, you know, it's a 42 footer, um, which, which, you know, they're a little more commonly made down in the Carolinas now, but for us, we just couldn't find one. And, uh, and honestly, price efficiency, you know, some of these boats coming out are a couple million bucks, you know, they do 60, 70 mile an hour. That's not the need for Lake Ontario fishing, so we wanted something that kept on performing and, and fishing at its best. So. We took on the project and it was uh, you know, a solid winter of work and, uh, and this is kind of what we came out in. And everything we kind of built around the application of chartering. You know, um, usability, user-friendly, um, placement of things, seating, helm, fish finders. Yeah, you know, let, let's kind of go over a few of those things just to lead you in the direction of uh, our thought process of how we created this boat. So one of the key features of the, uh, the rod wrestler is obviously its size. It's a, it's a 42 foot overall with um, a 15 foot beam. And um, you know, that, 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 it's a big platform to, wa uh, to work with. But honestly, with all the other techniques now, we like to run two riggers. And uh, you know, I did have my day where we kind of filled up this back trance and we had four riggers going. Um, and this is kind of going to tie back to our our charter days, I love a landing platform. You, you guys have seen on our uh, 
on the energy boat, we kind of spread rods out. You know, if everyone on the boat's pretty advanced and knows what they're doing, it's not overly a big deal. But with chartering, you're often having guys that are possibly on their first time ever fishing. So you want to kind of remove all the uh, negative opportunities with down rigger cables and stuff for lines to get tangled up or even break you off. And so two riggers, honestly, with all the other dipsies, lead cores we run, I, I, I believe we can pinpoint those deeper fish, but we also like to keep that wide open platform for netting as uh, you know, you never want to lose uh, clients fish of a lifetime due to some uh, little hiccup into a rigger cable or whatnot. So size helps in that circumstance. And you know, can't say enough about these guys, Custom Fishing Solutions. Um, I guess they've been around about four years now and they keep perfecting their art. And um, we, we obviously run them on this boat. The secondary one allows us to put our fillet board in at the end of the day, fillet up our fish for our charters. But also if we want to move that rigger rod over, we can lay it down and again, open up that landing platform as much as we can. Can't say enough about these guys. Locally made, made by fishermen and uh, always appreciate having them on board with us. So with lead cores being such a big part of our program, you know, we often run three aside. Um, it's great to utilize the framework of your hard tops. These are the clamp on ones. Uh, Taco Metals uh, provided these ones for us. I mean, nothing better than getting your rods up out of the way. Not something you need to watch all day. Fires, lines peeling. Uh, nice, quick, accessible, pull them out and had at them. Um, that was kind of one of the key parts when we redid this boat was enough rod holders. And to be honest, I don't know if there's ever enough rod holders, um, but just utilizing the whole structure and the framework of the boat to make it perform at its fullest. And again, keeps it tidy. All these rods up out of the way until you need them. You know, it's a perfect system. After we redid the boat, um, we did all the flooring in, in Sea Deck. Sea Deck's, a, you know, a newer brand of uh, material to, to put on your decking. It adds comfort and uh, it, it looks phenomenal. And even cooler tops. Uh, I, we did these back in, uh, in the early years of the Silver Salmon. And the key feature of these are you can personalize them with your own logo, right? And, uh, you know, this one's our Wheeled 120 that we bring up to the weigh stations every time. And, you know, it's kind of neat, a little brand recognition of, uh, of the team that's wheeling up the cooler. It goes a long way, right? So Mike at Launch Marine, he, uh, he takes care of all these things. So you can reach out to him and get your own personalized cooler top made, or you can even get logos in the back deck. It's, it's a really neat product that works well. So we're up here in the cockpit of the, uh, of the old rod wrestler. And to be honest, I mean, you can see right here, simplicity is the key for us. Um, ample bench seating, um, view of the whole boat, all the fishing rods, everything going on. Just got our windows in the other day. Um, Precision Canvas out of St. Catharines did a phenomenal job and uh, just helps enclose it all. Keeps the weather out. And um, you know, most of our guys are up here sitting. Obviously you see we don't have a seat here for the helm. And to be honest, we're always at our feet. Uh, not much opportunity when you're out charting or fishing to be sitting down and you know, it keeps you on your toes literally. Um, so again, real simple helm, wheel, throttles, shifters, it's all you need. And then up here is uh, you know, our, our bottom machines, which we'll get into a little bit here as uh, you know, we went with Garmin. Garmin's uh, incredibly user friendly. And since we switched over years back, I no intent of ever leaving them again because uh, they do everything we need to the fullest and you know with, with a few other extra options that we'll actually get into right now. So up here at the helm we're running uh, two Garmin 12 inch screens and uh, the reason we run the two we, we always like to have our GPS on and, and the bottom machine but you know you can also split screen them um, you know I know a couple of my guys like to run the pan optics live view that uh, 
a lot of you guys are familiar with and maybe looking to get a bit educated on and we'll touch on that in a bit um, but for our bottom machine key feature I like that's getting a little more common now with a lot of the uh, bottom machines is uh, coloring of the contour lines for us especially if we're trying to work a 50 60 foot range we've got a green bar there that just follows that depth range keeps us right in there you know it doesn't have to back and forth out of the helm and stuff we're using our autopilot uh, you know just a few little quick turns you can keep in those depths which I find if they're producing I want to stay right in them you know I don't want to venture too far out of them bottom machine one of the neat features that allows um, a bigger boat allows is where you're running your transducer uh, you know just like on our energy power sports boat the transducers off the uh, transit like, like many smaller boats are but what we've done with this boat being 42 feet we've put our transducer which is just a through haul unit up towards the front so I guess we got about from the bow to the transducer is about 12 feet so that gives us another 30 until the transom and what we find that helps us with if you're kind of really dialed into watching your graph and pick it up on marks and like we've touched on um, we're kind of visual fishermen we, we fish the marks opposed attempts and that uh, gives us adjustment times you know as, as, again as we've also talked about we don't run the longest of leads so if we're ready to drop a bait 10 15 20 feet this transducer being that much more forward gives us a bit of an advantage to get our baits down and ready as they uh, pass that fish so again you need a bigger boat to use that but it's really been a big part of our uh, of our program to have that transducer moved right forward so if we want to switch over to pan optics obviously with the garments really easy home and we're going to live view I call it pan optics uh, you know since it's kind of been streamlined to the term live view or um, live scope uh, when we were first introduced it about seven or eight years ago pan optics so excuse me if I use the wrong terminology but both of them do the same thing and what we do is we just have our uh, live view mounted on the transom and it gives you a wide angle and it's kind of for those that aren't familiar it's giving you a live feed of what's going on behind the boat and we could dial it in so we could read where our baits are and it lets you know when fish are around your baits and now I say that like that because since it came in new technology I'm all about it try to figure out see where it's leading see how to work with it see how to use it to our advantages um, and over the years I've come across a few things that I've noticed that I won't say work against you but might be misleading and um, you know that might be just us not really understanding how to use our equipment to the fullest but you know I also like to really put a lot of thought into it you know we're out here all day every day and uh, you know your mind wanders and you and you mess around with other electronics and um, I'm gonna be honest a few things that we found that was misleading that we had to kind of work out of our program was the size of the marks um, you know you, you'll come through you got your two baits you'll see a couple Mark streaking through, they, they leave some trails when they're moving quickly, they'll follow your bait, they'll follow the other one, dart around. Most of the time my guy's up looking at that saying there's a fish on the screen, that rod's already fired and he didn't even see that rod fire. So, um, you know, I guess it's, that's a bit of being able to swivel your head back and forth to read it. But I did have one scenario, um, one season where the West End was pretty iced out, you know, a lot of cold water and we had those, you know, 8 to 14 inch kings. Um, you know, we could tell because we were picking them up on the spoons, um, on our long lines, you know, it's just steady. There wasn't a big fish in sight. We didn't come across them. Now the pan optics was on. Those little dots were flying around our baits, making us scratch our head why they weren't firing. And um, I've come to a bit of a theory that the reason they were firing because those fish were too small to hit those baits. Does that matter? Probably not. You know there's fish in the area. This was just a, a unique scenario where there were smaller fish. But rolling into stagers, which is uh, one of our favorite parts of the game out of Port Credit, again with our pan optics, we were excited to get into that, you know, into that uh, 30, 40 foot range of water as, you know, the stagers, we call them wolf packs. They, you know, they get together three or four fish, getting familiar with each other. Now they showed up on my pan optics, the same size dot, the same size trail 
as those eight to 12 inch little Chinooks. So that really got me questioning how to read our units to their fullest. I think in knowing that, it could be a bit misleading. You know, a lot of guys want to know, they, they, they track those fish following their baits. Oh, why aren't they firing? I better change the bait. I better, better change the speed, better move them up and down. I question, what if they're not actual fish big enough to hit those baits and, and you're chasing, uh, chasing a ghost, you know? Um, this is probably me overthinking it, but I just, you know, I believe in pan optics. I believe in live view. They're great extra feature to help you um, improve your day's fishing. But again, just like a speed and temp probe, they can be misleading. And honestly, you, you need to open up outside of that. You know, it, there is no push button catch fish. There is no fail safe plan to say, these are the technologies now that are gonna catch me more fish. You need to be able to adapt and use your own instinct and intu uh, ingenuity, forgive me on that word, but you need to be able to use your own self understanding of the fishery on top of it. Yes, electronics, temperature probes, they all add a benefit to the fishery when used correctly or just you can't rely on them. You can't just say, there it is, I'm catching more fish now. You know, you got to know how to use this stuff. And these are some of the things that for trolling, I know these things have changed the industry with bass fishing, cast fishing and all that, but I'm just talking strictly the application of salmon trolling, which these are some of the things that has it improved my fishing? I don't know. I'm, I'm still waiting to see that. And it might be just a learning curve that maybe you guys can even help us with, with some of the techniques you use. But these are the, some of the key features I find if a guy buys his first fish finder, plugs in live view and starts following and wondering why he's not catching those marks. Chances are those marks aren't even big enough to bite. Vince has come a long way. He's got the walk back done and he's taking full advantage of the big platform here. 12, 12 feet astride he's getting. Sounds like he's got a pretty good fish. Just the two of us out today, so we'll see how it goes, but seven color, we pulled our high rigger and put a seven color down and lo and behold, it's our first fish of the afternoon. It's one of our biggest ones of the year. <laughs> Bigger than I felt, that's good. <laughs> So an interesting technique that we do here with our uh, leading post is we don't actually bring the fish directly on board. Um, once we net it, you know, this is an advantage of the bigger boat. We'll put it on our gripper, bring it out. You know, you, you guys can get a photo with it or whatnot, but this one we're releasing. So what we'll do, we got about a 20 foot, sorry, I won't say 20, I probably about 12 foot long leader there. And um, now the water's warming up. This is a technique that we like to use just to give those fish an opportunity to revive. Um, you know, the fish is just lightly gripped in the lips. Gives them an opportunity to catch their breath. You know, these guys just fought for their life. Water's 65 degrees. This just gives them a little more time just to relieve their stresses and uh, catch their breath for say. And then we'll give them about, you know, 30 seconds out there, possibly a minute. And then we'll release it. And over the years, I know a lot of you guys use this technique and that's what we put out these uh, repellent grippers for the early bird. And we still have more, so you guys reach out or they're still at some of the tackle stores. It's just gonna give that fish a better opportunity to revive for a leave, you know? And uh, I think uh, this day and age, everyone's more concerned about the, uh, you know, the um, sustainability of our fishery. So the more we can do to contribute back there with a good release, just to ensure they don't float. You guys have all seen it, the seagulls come in on them. This here, I don't know if Vince can get a shot of it. This fish is already swimming with us down below. He's ready for the release. Two ways to go about it. You can torpedo them down, but I find after the revive, it's just a matter of release and it's gone. Repellent grippers, honestly. They're plastic, which I don't mind because they float. You're never gonna lose them. Uh, you know, they, they have the bogas. 
metal. And to be honest, I've uh, never been comfortable putting my $600 boga over the back to drag a fish. These work perfectly. Make sure you get a pair before the season's over. Well, it was definitely a nice afternoon to get back out on the old girl and uh, yeah, still fishes as good as always. But to be honest, uh, pretty excited to get back out in that Alumacraft for the uh, Summer King of Kings. That's uh, one of our favorite events. We'll see you guys then. Mm -hmm.